This panel is entitled Lave Ikam Alaya Aku Ono Ono, Acquire Skill and Make It Deep, and will feature a panel of artists who will share their iki about art and education. As I um, have the opportunity to introduce each of our panel members to you, we'll invite them to come forward and get seated on the stage. And if I can just ask you to hold all applause until after each person has been introduced. Our moderator for this afternoon is Vicky Holt Takamine, founder and kumuhula of Papa Lawae o Makana on Kauai Island. In April 2010, Vicky officially opened an extension of her halau in New York City, Pua Ali'i Ilima o Nuioka. Vicky received her BA and MA in Dance Ethnology from the University of Hawaii. She is a lecturer at the University of Hawaii Music Department and Leeward Community College. Vicky is recognized as a Native Hawaiian leader for her role as an advocate for the protection of Native Hawaiian rights, social justice issues, and the protection of the natural and cultural resources of Hawaii. She is the co-founder and executive director of Pa'i Foundation, an arts organization that is established to preserve and perpetuate Hawaiian cultural traditions for future generations. Felina manoa i kalehu aloha. Aloha ua tu ahine, mai lua hine a iwa i kiki, ki a i ke kahau kani, kani no na leo, eo kama aina, aina aloha e, mano e, aloha. Aloha. Our first panelist, Imai Kalani Kalahele, was born and raised in Honolulu and currently resides on the grounds of Mu'olaulani, the Queen Lili'uokalani Children's Center. <clears throat> a husband, father, and grandfather, Imai Kalani is the consummate poet, musician, warrior, artist. Multi-talented and multifaceted, Imai Kalani paints, draws, and creates fibrous sculptures, often infused with his long gray hair. His words and works address issues of cultural and social justice for the Native Hawaiian Aww. people. Okay. Sabra Kauka is the coordinator of the Department of Education, Kauai Hawaiian Studies component. She is also the Hawaiian Studies Kumu and Kumuhula of Napua o Kamaile at Island School and a cultural practitioner and artist in Kapa and Lauhala. Along with many active volunteers in the Napali Coast, Ohana, she leads restoration and malama aina efforts at Nualolo Kai State Park, Kauai. In addition, she is co-chairing Ka'ahahula o Halau Aola World Hula Conference set for July 10th through the 18th, 2014. She is a graduate of Kamehameha Schools and the University of Hawaii. And our final panelist, Carl Pau, is an arts teacher at Kamehameha Schools Kapalama, born and raised in Kailua on the island of Oahu, and in 1994, graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Furthering his study in Auckland, Aotearoa, Pau earned his Master's in Fine Arts from Elam School of Fine Arts, and also came to realize the strength and validity that exists in the artistic expressions of indigenous peoples. He hopes his work will speak to people on many different levels, allowing room for others to draw their own conclusions while appreciating the statement he makes as an artist. Please join me in welcoming this afternoon's panel. And I will now turn the floor over to Vicky, who will moderate this discussion. Okay, aloha kako. Aloha. 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 Um, I thought it would be really appropriate as we started this conversation with the, our three visual artists here. I, I'm a performing artist, I'm not a visual artist. I remember my first class, uh, and, and I did take woodshop with, you know, Papa Bowman. He made the pig board, and I sanded it. That was my extent of my carving skills. I also, he tried to get us to carve a bowl that I, it went puka through, so he just said, that's okay, baby. Here's your pig board. So I just sanded it and varnished. It was really good. <laughs> then I went into hula. Um, but I have never, you know, I've always appreciated art. But as we come into this building, which was built in the year 2000, uh -huh. and they purchased artwork for this building. 
over $1 million worth of artwork was purchased for this building that we sit in. Not one penny went to a Native Hawaiian artist. Not one penny of our $1 million tax dollars went to a Native Hawaiian artist. I was incensed at that, but I can imagine our visual artist community, how upset they were. I remember coming to a meeting here where they rolled out their strategic plan called Ke Kumu. And I questioned, do you know what that means? Do you know what Kumu means? Do you know what the source means? Where's the source of the inspiration for this building, for this land that you sit on? Whose land is this? Where are the ancestral people? Where is the artwork from our eyes? So this building was built for tourism. We were not even allowed to come in the building to look at the artwork. I remember coming, they asked me, are you have business here to go up the escalator? And they were like, uh, no, are you here for, no. Well, I'm sorry, you can't come in here. Um, then I got more mad, okay? Because you know what happens when that happens, when I get mad. Um, but as we started to look at what was happening at the State Foundation of Culture and the Arts, no Native Hawaiian was sitting on the commission. Um, they told me that there's two bookcases of real artwork from the Bishop Museum. And my response to them is dead art done by dead people and nobody today does hala, does feather work, does you know, n kapa. Nobody does those traditional things today. Not one person of Native Hawaiian ancestry was commissioned. Um, and that was my motivation to go to the state legislature. I want my own Office of Hawaiian Culture and Arts. For two years, I lobbied the legislature. Two years, I got turned down. Then I lobbied. I sent a letter of inquiry to the Ford Foundation. They said, well, go do a needs assessment survey. So I did. Um, and learned a lot about my, our visual artists and the lack of support for their artwork and why we were not in exhibits. We were not invited to be, um, to participate in the exhibition here. I boycotted the opening of this. We were asked to bring our kumu. I was in part of Ilio. We were asked to bring all of our drums that we had used at the Capitol to open this building, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and none of us came. We all boycotted the opening ceremonies for this. Um, even though others who came actually came from the neighbor islands to do it because our Oahu people were not. It was like, you know, I told them we ain't doing it, so they didn't. Um, and so I think from there, this is where we're launching this. I, I wanted to um, kind of lay the groundwork so every time I come in this building, I'm looking for artwork done by our people. Um, and so just lately, they've started to bring um, our Native Hawaiian artists to do murals in here. Are these permanent murals? Are they still here, or are they just here for exhibition? We bring in a display, a Mamo exhibit, um, and, and Miley Meyer is pulling that hui together to bring our Native Hawaiian artists together to, lo to open up a gallery space here when we have large conventions as a way to talk about Native Hawaiian art. That's not good enough for me. I want something permanent. I want something that's here that's gonna to speak to what we see, our vision of what our land means to us and not what other people think of Hawaii. So if you walk around while you're here and don't forget to read the labels and you can always say, I said, oh, I know that one is a Japanese artist because that looks like Mount Fuji. That so does not look like any of our mountains. So it's other people's perception of what our Hawaii is like. And it's not coming from us. And that, to me, is an issue that I still have problems with. OK, so we're launching there. <laughs> so so steal the thunder. But I think maybe I'm going to start with, um, we have questions, and it's not that I'm gonna ignore the questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I have, I have questions that I really want answered from, I, I really I am interested. If you can go back to your first art piece, the first piece that kind of tell, told you that you were the artist, 
what was that piece? Who inspired you to do that piece? Who was your teacher? Who was your mentor? And think about your earliest art piece. If you, if you have, can go back that far, brother. Yeah, from we'll the start 60s. with you, Imai. <laughs> we have a time warp, you know. We have a time warp. Do you want me to go with the youngest person and give us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. So we'll start with Carl, Papa. So we'll start with Carl. He has fresh memory. <laughs> so fresh. Uh, let's see. There's two pieces. Uh, my parents were excellent at documenting uh, the works that I did as um, a child and youth and um, teenager. And they were always very supportive, nurturing and um, promoting um, my, my drawing um, or my creative uh, talents. And one of the first images I can remember uh, doing and actually my mom uh, kept was uh, this circular kind of shape with these arms coming out, more circles. And, and now it, I look back at it and it's what I'm doing now. <laughs> It's, uh, it was, I would think it was 18 months, two years. Uh, I just remember that. I just, but I'm doing these clouds that are basically kind of evolution of that first drawing. And the second one would be a shark and triangles. Uh, I just thought sharks were really cool and I always drew sharks. And I knew that my tutu uh, that she and her sisters in Haula, they learned to swim with, with our Omakua shark over there. Uh, so I knew that connection, but I didn't know that until later in life. But it was, I guess the inspiration there is my, my ancestors and I inherit knowledge for myself and trying to connect even when I was not conscious of that, wanting to connect. So I guess that those three or two uh, drawings um, that's the earliest I can remember, and also they inspire me today too with what I do. And you were 18 months old, two years old. I was two years old. I, yeah, I was pretty surprised when I looked at the age. My mom wrote down the age of everything. It was a large, it was wow. big, so I was like really, I must have been really into it. Uh, Very cool. Who was your first art teacher? Do you remember? I would say it was my parents mm. and my grandmother. Uh, my mom, she's from St. Louis of French, uh, Scott Irish, Croatian uh, heritage. And her uh, parents came over to basically look after us. So my grandmother was always had us with crayons and um, Play Doh and just being outdoors and being creative. Uh, so my grandmother, my mom, she always uh, tried to paint and uh, she played the piano. My father was a cabinet maker. Uh, so I, I always had creative energies around me. Uh, as far as school, uh, elementary time, Mrs. Connie Mori at Channel Lakes Elementary. She looked after me um, through my seven years there. Uh, middle school was a little different, it was Catholic school. Uh, we didn't really have an art program. And then when I got to high school at Kamehameha, Paul Lama, I had uh, several mentors, and Don Harvey, who's um, head of the art department, and is my boss. Um, he was a big inspiration uh, then. And then coming through that, uh, just been personal research on trying to find out who I am and uh, connect with my Hawaiian um, heritage, um, and also look at other uh, issues. Um, that I deal with as a person. So, yeah, I guess. Okay, mahalo. In short. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get to dig into this, yeah. Okay, Kalka, we'll start with you. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, well, thinking back on it, my goodness, you know, uh, my class celebrated our 50th, our golden anniversary for our reunion this year. And to think back now, 68 years, uh, probably my first influence in, in, in art was uh, both my mother and my tutu and my tutu very much in the fiber arts in lauhala weaving because the floor of her hale had uh, moina, lauhala. And every couple of years she would weave new mats to put on the floor. And uh, so my aunties all said, oh, when we grow up, we're gonna have carpet. Forget this <laughs> lauhala stuff. So when we grew up, we all, you know, we all had carpets and then I started sneezing. 
<laughs> and then I said, okay, out goes the carpet, down goes the wood floor, and now comes the moina again. Uh, but in the, in the, I see myself more as a fiber artist than a visual artist, but there was a book report I had to do in elementary school, and I had to make a cover for the book report. And my mother helped me with that. I don't even remember the book. All I remember is the cover. And it was a, uh, it was a mo'olelo about uh, an American Indian uh, girl. And so I drew what I thought would look like a Native American girl. And uh, with a lot of help from my mom. And then she kept that book report. She kept that cover for years and years and years, like your family. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, why is she collecting all this stuff? But over the years, she had collected pieces that I had done. And uh, at the time, you think, oh, why does she keep like being all this stuff? But I think it had an influence. But more recently, though, since uh, I returned home about 25 years ago, after Kamehameha, I was gone for many years. And when I returned home, um, jumping right back into the culture, you know, you get hungry for the culture if you're not living here. If you go away to school and you're gone for many years, you get very hungry for the culture. And, uh, and I mahalo Kumu Viki very much for coming to Kauai for 11 years, 11, 12 years to teach us there, hula and many other things. And, uh, but it was through uh, uh, Hui Malama and the repatriation process uh, and the Native American Graves uh, Repatriation and Protection Act that we had hundreds of Ivikupuna come home to Kauai. And in 1993, we had begun to make kapa again uh, in our Hawaiian studies hui. In 1995, we got a grant from Office of Hawaiian Affairs to hold four kapa workshops on Kauai. And my main intention in kapa, going into the kapa was to make my kihei for, for oli and hula. In the process of doing this, the uh, Kauai Burial Council uh, uh, came to us and asked us to make kapa for the kupuna iwi. And so we did, and we made over 100 pieces of kapa for the kupuna. And along with this, they needed the, they needed the baskets, the lauhala baskets, to go with that project. So. For many years, for a better part of 10 years, we made kapa and we wove baskets for the kupuna iwi. So I thank all those members of Hui Malama for leading the effort, the early effort, to return our kupuna iwi to their place of origin. And I thank the inspiration uh, that came to all of us through that process and the leadership uh, that was involved in bringing it but today, moving it forward is so much more exciting because we're making kapa for today's practitioners, for today's hula uh, dancers, and beautiful work. Uh, and, and teaching like Kawaikini uh, school, they have now had three classes of the seniors of Puka, and each one of them has made their kapa kihei for graduation. And that makes, that just is so fulfilling and so happy uh, to share uh, the Ike with our Hamana who will then carry it on. And so again, I thank those who, the visionaries and the leaders like Vicky from early on who led this effort. Okay. Hmm? Oh. Okay. <laughs> he wake up. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, uh, <laughs> man, I don't know. Um, First, uh, I don't know. Uh, I kind of always used to make stuff. Um, yeah, I always used to make stuff. That's why, like, if you notice, if you know my sculptures, uh, my sculptures are just made up of anything I can get my hands on. Um, my, I, you know, I'd like to say my mother, which she was, but really kind of, you know, it's okay. Okay, this is the truth. The reason why I don't weave hala, because you know what my job was? Smoky time. Clean them. Cleaning oh, and shipping them. Yeah. Saturday morning, the boys come by. Bro, we're going to Alamoana. I meet you guys. <laughs> <laughs> if I can. So, oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, my mom was a weaver. Uh, 
um, my mom used to make cocoa. Uh, but for me, I, you know, that was never, it, it, mm -hmm. I don't know, it was just something, you know, we used to do like it. Um, our, uh, I, I, you know, there were two things I always knew I could do. Okay. Never learned how to read, never learned how to write, <laughs> but I could sing and I could draw. So I did that a lot. Yeah. And um, in high school, mostly high school. Yeah, well, okay, let me give you my, my, my teacher trip. Okay. These are all the teachers I ever had about art. In, okay. uh, I got kicked out of Roosevelt sophomore year <laughs> by the art teacher. Ooh. By the art teacher. Ooh. Which actually was a really good turn on because that meant I had to go back to McKinley. <laughs> and what that meant was there was a teacher at McKinley that was totally phenomenal. Oh, good. Mini Fujita. This Wahini was awesome. Uh, I learned more about creating things mm. from her than drawing or painting techniques. What she would do is she would send us out on, a, you know, give us a piece of paper. Tell us, okay, go draw me something, anything. Go outside. So everybody grab a pencil, eh? take all the pencils away. No more pencil. Huh? So, so what are we gonna do? I don't know. Make something. Get on a piece of grass, smash them up, make something, make something, make something. Just go make something. Draw me on a picture. That kind of process for me mm. really worked. Much more than sitting down mixing circles, like mm. that, mm. and you know, cut them in half and cut them in half and cut them in half again. Uh, because for me, that led more to the kinds of stuff I knew. Hmm. You know, uh, I knew how to make hala. Yeah, I knew how to do that. Uh, it never, it, hala for me was never art. Hala was go work. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> but once you get that thing about making things out of things, hmm. you know, just finding anything, making any kind, uh, it sets off a creative process. And in high school, I was very fortunate. I had Mini Fujita, then later I had Charlie Higa who came to McKinley, mm. another phenomenal artist, a fantastic watercolor painter, uh, and ceramics. And these guys used to just let us go. You know, I mean, there was five guys that did ceramics in his class that he said, okay, if you guys come in Saturdays, any clay you can reclaim, that barrel is yours. So we would just come on Saturdays and make clay. Just fought around. We, he would just open up the class and let us play. And it was just that whole creative process, you know, and then drawing and all of these stuff. And at the same time in high school, I also had Louis Paul, a mm -hmm. couple classes with Asherman. Uh, and just enough of what that kind of art is like. Uh, I don't think I understood it then, but I think I understand it now that what I was starting to understand is that, you know, there's this thing called a creative process. Now, when you take five years to go through high school, creative <laughs> processes, a lot of, yeah, that's, that's not one term you use, uh, but it was, you know, and consequently, my work has all been like that. I mean, I'm a painter, I'm a sculptor, I make any kind, um, and, you know, people have asked me, well, you know, can settle on anything? I don't know, because after a while, this just get boring and I'll go do something else. Mm -hmm. But my other thing is that I think art is a matter of creation. And uh, one of the things I think we do in a society is that we create things that maybe had never been around before. Good, bad, indifferent, whether you like it or not, whether it works, whether it doesn't. New ideas spur new ideas, and that's my philosophy. And that's basically how I teach. Uh, like I said, it took me a long time to get out of high school, and that's about <laughs> as far as I went. Uh, my teaching style is what I know belongs to you. That's my style. So we're going to make something. Yeah, it's kind of already. Th that already answers our second question. <laughs> Okay, so, can go back to and, and that's why I'm <laughs> saying we don't have to really stick to the questions because the second question was how does this inspiration facilitate the process of creating art? And I think that's exactly what you know Imai has already said. Just let us go. We and and as Native Hawaiians, we learn differently. 
we feel differently. So this conference on culture-based education is really critical to our understanding of how we connect to our own ohana, our own students, and how we then can motivate. Understanding how we went through, how we learned in the past, how we can motivate. Not all, we don't all learn the same way. Some of us are visual learners. Some of us need to be auditory. Some of us have to see. We have to read what it says, you know. So how does this inspiration facilitate the process of creating the art? I'm going to just share what my role was in the Lawahala making. My grandma place on Moloka'i, Dora place, was a weaver as well. And when every year we would go to her house, and this is my experience of art making. Every year we would go to Moloka'i. My father was a land surveyor. And um, he would save all of his jobs for surveying the land on Moloka'i for the summer. And he would take all of us kids up there. Grandma, knowing that we were all coming, every year had a project for us. So one year, she cut aloha shirts in every size for every person. And we all made aloha shirts, all of us. So we had cousins. She had 10 children. And some of those 10 children had 10 children. And my dad had five. We were the Hanai family of all of them. We would all end up on the same weekend. And I remember the year that she, de she decided we were all going to make hala. Mm -hmm. She had this old washing machine, kind of with the rolling pins. Mm -hmm. And me and my sister would have to feed the hala through that old washing machine to soften the hala mm -hmm. for days while we made the kuka'a, mm -hmm. while somebody else did the stripping. So all of us kids all learned to do We all had a project. She had a placemat. We all, then one year was quilting. So she had cut patterns for everybody, wow. and we all quilted one summer. And so those were fun days with my grandma place. She was not my real grandma, but we, she hanai, my mother, and our family. Um, but it was, it was that kind of how to create art by just creating projects for us to do during our summer. And some will take to that, so you know that from that family, from that exposure, it's exposure to that, you know. You'll, there will be somebody who will take up hala, who will take up weaving, who will take up, you know, um, carving. So that, that's the fun part of doing, of introducing different kinds of things. So in your teaching, what ways does art stimulate and motivate teaching and learning? How does art support students with different learning needs and styles and help students learn different subject areas, make learning relevant, build relationships, and inspire other students? So let's break that down. Is how does art support students with different learning needs? Back to me. <laughs> yeah, just, just jump in. Well. I think it, it provides an opportunity because there's like in my city, there's like no one way to express yourself or to problem solve. Um, so that's for me, I, I would usually like to have a theme. It's kind of like, you know, here's the piece of paper, you know, here's the theme and I'll do what I can to help you get to your destination, to your vision. Um, so it provides a lot of leeway for different learners. Um, and also, not just necessarily different learners, but people with different uh, interests. Because um, uh, there might be some that are just thinking about football all day. They like teach high school. Um, you know, others thinking about, I don't know what they're gonna have for lunch. So try to navigate through you know, where their minds might be. And um, I think art allows for that to happen, or that creative process. When you kind of have a hands-off um, approach and not just kind of like drilling it, this is how you got to do it. Uh, I find that doesn't necessarily work. Well, I don't know, because I teach, because I teach a lot of stuff. Like my, I taught Napu and Ayao for the first 10 years. And everybody would ask, well, what do you do in your class? And my response was always, uh, we make any kind. But that's literally, we make any kind. And my reasoning basically is, one, I'd like people to touch as much different kinds of things as possible. You know, my classes, we all paint a mural. We all, we, uh, they compile a, a work of poetry. 
Uh, we, I have them design their own patterns to make kiheis. I have them design their own. They, everybody work with bone. Everybody work, learn how to weave something, braid something. And the idea is, one, not everybody likes to braid. Not everybody likes to sit down and draw. Not everybody likes to write. Uh, so the more things out there, uh, if you find something that interests somebody that doesn't, that thing can sometimes lead into something else, especially when, like I said, in my classes, we all do a lot of, a lot of things. My classes, they all had to turn in, they had to, one poem a day. But the poem could be about anything. And if you, if you, if you did it right, you could even write a two-word poem. I don't care. I don't care what it is. Give me something about anything. If I got to tell you how to look, I'll give you a direction. But if not, just go. Just make them. There's no such thing as bad art. There's no such thing as bad poetry. Because we are not here creating masterpieces. We're here playing with art. And for me, that's the more important thing. And the more things you have, the, you know, like you say, not everybody like this or they like that. Mm -hmm. And attention spans, and I work a lot with city kids, because I'm from town. And sometimes our town kids, you know, they're so removed from things Maori. I mean, it's a lot better now, but you know, before they were so removed from things Hawaiian, they didn't know what anything Hawaiian was. So my way of teaching, my method actually, I call it the Ono method. I just gonna keep cooking until I find your Ono. Then once you get your ono, ah, then you can go make your own. So that's how I teach, and that's, that's how I look at needs from different people. All right? Just find the ono. Yeah, I think that's a really different way of looking at education from a Western um, perspective, because a lot, especially with our new requirements of what we have to come out with at the end, we teach for what we have to come out with at the end, right? I mean, as, as educators, they've got to Sorry meet standards. That. And what are those standards? And how do we get to those standards? But we forget that we have other directions on how to get to those standards that are required for a degree. Um, and I think that that's what I like about Native Hawaiian teachers, because we're not afraid to go outside the box, outside of the boundaries of what is education. So we are, and, but I think what we have to do is how to make those connections with those standards. And, and as um, I'm hoping what comes out of a conference like this is how do we satisfy the requirements of the DOE system or the standardized tests without having to comply with the methodology of getting there. And I, I think the charter schools are at the forefront of that. Um, of that work, of that work. Uh, and they can probably lead that work because they're not bound by limitations. So I think that that's the kind of work that Imai is doing or Imai was doing in, in trying to allow students, you know. So how does that, in the creation of that, for instance, when making kihei or using plant materials to dye, mm -hmm. how do we take that process to the science teacher and say, mm -hmm. what's the chemical reaction of heating up this yeah. plant material? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens chemically yeah. Yeah. to this? Yeah. And how we can take that, that process of plant material, scraping the olena, immersing it in, in water, heating it up, immersing the fabric into that, what happens chemically to that how do we get the dye? So can we make that translation from traditional cultural practice to science? Um, sailing, I just saw Chad Paishan outside. What is, how fast do we have to get, how fast do we have to go on this va'a to get to the end mathematically? How navigationally, how do we use the triangulations to get where we have to go, scientific, using astronomy, um, linking those to our cultural practices. So I think that, that part of all of this creativity and allowing artists or arts to lead that challenge. So
sometimes is a way to meet the requirements of that. I, I really like you, Michael Lani's uh, Find Your Ono. Mm. Because that's that's I can make t shirt that yeah, find your own. <laughs> find, your own. <laughs> find what, what it is that you're good at. Find what it is that you really enjoy doing. And I think as 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 teachers, as part of our job is to help our Hamana find what it is that they're good at. This year I had a particularly kolohi class of fourth grade boys. And I couldn't, you know. They were good to go climb the lauhala, the puhala, and go hemo the lau, but for sit down and weave, <laughs> ole kila, they weren't so good at that. What else were they good at? They were good at picking the kukui, uh, the lau, uh, but, but they weren't so good to make the hipu'u style of lei. Oh, but they were good at make, collecting the kukui and sanding it and making the hu. And finally, when uh, I showed them uh, pohaku, I showed them one bowl. Mm. They went, oh, wow, Kumu, how you made that? And I said, oh, you're interested, you want to learn. And I found enough funding to buy just enough of those little ball peen hammers. <laughs> and then uh, one of the tutukane of one of the boys, he has a stream going through his property, and I asked him, uncle, can we have X amount of pohaku for the hamana to make bowls? Oh my goodness, I couldn't tear them away from it. Once they started, that was it. Tap, 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 tap. And they came to me with, you know, if they broke the stone, Aoli Pilikia, here's another one. Try it again to get the feel. But the most kolohi boy of all, oh, he made the most beautiful bow. I was so proud of him. I took a picture of him and sent it home to his tutu man. And then the next thing he is doing, he's on the playground looking for pohaku that he can tap, 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 tap. Mm -hmm. And he put one bowl at my door of my office and he said, this is for you, Kumu. I said, oh, wow. So he found his ono, fourth grade, he found them. And I hope he can continue with that. My mm -hmm. um, So I think we kind of touched into how does art help learn students different subject areas and make learning relevant to build relationships, inspire our students? So what other, for your art, I know that you, you do a lot of, um, the last time I visited you, you were making holua. So you, with all of the, the work that goes into holua sled making, how do you think that that teaches other method, other, other subject matters? How does that translate into other subject matters? Or does it? Oh, it does, because you, well, why don't you get into, you can get into um, forestry, botany. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about just your materials, mm -hmm. um, but then also location, where you're gonna practice, where you're gonna attempt to go um, sliding. Um, and the experience I had with I was more or less helping make a um, holua. Um, looking at how those um, customary materials can translate to modern day materials and if they will actually work and do the same. So and then looking at the scientific side of it too. Um, so it, it does lend to um, exploring other uh, avenues and finding other ono um, things that you know might interest you, and um, also as an educator, I think a big part of being the creative process is again trying to find that ono mm -hmm. and make those connections. Um, I think what comes to mind when I when I think about what you just said and what all of you are sharing too is, how do you find access to the materials? Okay, mm -hmm. so you know I'm going to go to the political we're side now, right? Part of it is, where, where <laughs> are we going to go get? So if you want to do, you know, in, um, in Halal, when we celebrated our 25th anniversary, I realized that, you know, what, what for me is cultural practice and uh, sort of common in our ohana is we call a pig for a celebration. That's what we do. So my father did every New Year's Eve because his sister was born on New Year's Eve and his father born on New Year's Day, the pig came out at midnight. So every year to celebrate both, we would, our family was, my father was the Kalua pig. Um, and I realized that 
some of my haumana, I had never had that experience. Mm -hmm. So then we said, we tell them, okay, so we're going to Kalua Pig for our, our, you know, for our 25th year halal anniversary. Okay, so what we need, we need a pig. Okay, so I said, I'll go get the pig. What else do we need? So I brought in one of my friends, my, my, the husbands of my um, student, and I said, you are the master Kalua Pig person. You're going to teach my class. Well, I, I, I cannot teach class, you know, come on. I, I don't know how to do that. I was like, no, but you, since he's been a baby, he was doing Kalua Pua. Like, so you, you're the expert. Come in. I said, okay. Well, I, 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 cannot, I cannot do that. I said, okay. All right, so what do we need? We need to dig the hole. Okay, after you dig, I said, what do we put in the puka? He says, okay, well, you need kiabe. I said, okay. What kind of kiabe? Wet kiabe? Cut. No, 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 no. You got to go get the dry kiabe. The kind that's all dried. And I said, okay. How much kiabe? You know your husband's truck? Fill him up. I was like, okay. So I told the halal. I mean, he was in halal. I said, okay, I need a truck full of kiabe dried. Okay, what else do we need? Pohaku. Any kind of pohaku? No, no, no. You got, you, you got to have, you know, porous pohaku. Okay, so any size, any shape. I don't know. You got to have that skinny kind and the fat to go in the slits of the pukas where your armpit, you got to find, and in the belly, you got to have the round one, and over here, the cavities, you have to have, and the one that goes in the neck, you have to find shapes of of pohaku. I said, okay, but any kind? Just like go outside the backyard? No, you gotta have porous. Where you, where you find the porous ones? Or in the riverbed? You gotta go find the river rocks. I was like, oh, okay. Otherwise, you know, it's gonna explode in your pua and there went your kalua pig. So, okay, what else do you need? Oh, banana stuff. Uh, how, how much, how much pohaku? You, you know your husband's truck? Go fill them up. I was like, okay. And what about banana stuff? We need, what else we need? Banana or tea leaves? No, 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 go get banana, banana stump, banana leaves, yeah. Okay, what, you just cut them down and just throw them in the, yeah, yeah you know your husband's truck, fill them up. So it was, husband's <laughs> truck busy. <laughs> it was, so it was that kind of knowledge that is, mm -hmm. for us, maybe common sense. Mm -hmm. And then I told the students, I said, go get it. And they're like, um, Kumu, where are we going to get it? I don't know. You need access, you got to go find how will we do our cultural practice? Same way we teach halau, hula. You're gonna build a holua sled. What kind of wood mm -hmm. do you need? Where do you get it? Mm -hmm. You know, we go out mm -hmm. and we go get for our hamana. For a kumu and halau when we uniki, my kumu told me, you wanna be a kumu? Go make your pahu. Who's gonna teach us how to make our pahu and where we're gonna get the, you know, what kind of, you wanna be a kumu? You go figure it out? Um, where do we get the tree? Go find one. Where do we get, the, go find it. What kind of ferns do we need to make our lays? Go find it. We had to go make everything that we needed. And we had to find access to it. Which when the legislature tried to legislate that, would have killed our cultural practice. Mm -hmm. Access not just for hula people, for fishermen, for farmers, for cultural practitioners, for weavers, for carvers. We still are in that battle to maintain that. So how does then our art? Art is at the intersection of social justice. It's at the intersection. Artists lead that fight um, for access to our cultural practice Artists are inspired other artists to fight for their water rights, to fight for access to the land, to fight for the, for, so, you know, I've been um, kind of looking at how, uh, where does our, what does my art inspire? My art inspires, for me, I have four planners in Halau that are all in urban planning private firms, architectural, Department of Transportation, Hawaiian Homelands, looking at how we manage our lands. We have halal that are educators. We have, I, 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 I don't teach hula just to teach hula. Mm -hmm. But I think team. my art inspires yeah. the activists, I... inspires people to take mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. on items. They come to me with things that they find. Mm -hmm. You know, see this book, Kumu? You know, they spelled the Hawaiian wrong in the whole book and it's really bad. I was like, you know what? Okay, literature. 
did you hire an edit, ed, editor to edit all the English? They did. Well, you know, I said, did you, well, he says, well, there's so much Hawaiian, if you were just, I said, but if you hire an editor to edit the English, shouldn't you hire a native Hawaiian language specialist to edit all the Hawaiian in the book? That was a big topic of discussion. I had the book removed from all the shelves in the bookstores because of that. And it changed publishing. It forced them to go out. And so things like that as we as artists, and you know, Imai's been doing this for years. So when, when we say, how does this inspire our students mm -hmm. and learning different subject areas? I hope they go yeah. out and become activists and, and lawyers yeah. and yeah. medicinal yeah. practitioners yeah. and, you know. Yeah. Uh, just, just as an example on Kauai, uh, we quickly learned that if we wanted to teach the Hawaiian cultural arts, we needed those plants and all those things that are associated with cultural arts. And I feel really lucky because we have a partnership with the National Tropical Botanical Garden and the Makawahi mm -hmm. Cave Project, mm -hmm. and they're growing many native species and Polynesian introduced species that we have taken into the schools and taken into the community so that we can kanu our own plants to use for, for all of these things. Uh, also because, you know, Kauai is famous for the mokihana, and yet we realize when we go up Mauka and we look at the plant and, you know, the tree branches broken, something knocked down, and, uh, so alarming sometimes when you see how much mokihana goes out of the forest, but who is planting that? Who, who is returning it back to the forest? And there are people now in Kauai who are doing that. They'll take any old dry mokihana lei that you have, and they can sprout it, and they can give it back to you, and you can take it up back, back up mauka. But this whole thing of practicing uh, art uh, with a cultural focus, uh, it's dependent on those natural resources. When I want to teach my haumana to make the vaiho'olu'u, the dyes, okay, that beautiful yellow ma'ohao hele. But you know what? You got to grow that plant if you want that pua. And if you want the beautiful green that comes from that pua. And then you have to know when is that pua blooming, okay? What time of year does it bloom? What time of year are you what time of year is the best time to uh, cut your valke? Right after rainy season. So they begin to observe and to learn uh, the seasons of these plants, when they're their best, when they're at their fullest. And it's been fantastic because we are expanding now uh, with our science teachers, in partnership with our science teachers, so that they can, in fact, uh, e explain the processes of using the mordants, whether you're going to use pa'akai, whether you're going to use uh, uh, vinegar, uh, whether if you're lucky enough to have mimi from young children, what is the different effect of those different mordants? And I marvel every time I look at uh, the collections of kapa, either in the Smithsonian or Bishop Museum, because of how pa'a those dyes are after all these hundreds of years they are still exceedingly beautiful. And I, I feel that, that we, we're still learning. We're still learning how to do that. There's so much more to learn. But it's dependent on those, 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 it's dependent on nature. It's dependent on the plants. It's dependent on all these things that Vicky has, has mentioned. Um, so what role do you hope culturally relevant art will play in education? What is culturally relevant art? Uh, ah, good question. What is, what culturally, is culturally relevant, what, what do you relevant think, art? What do you, what do you think culturally relevant art is? I don't know. If, okay, for me, if you could say culturally relevant, uh, what culture are we talking about? And I'm not only talking about what race yeah. culture. Yeah. I mean, because when we talk culture, you know, sometimes we get, uh, kind of like we, we get caught up in, in this thing. Every time you mention culture, oh, we got to go back to the Ali, oh, we got to go back to all that kind of stuff. Mm. Well, no, that, as, as my kai, that's that culture. Mm. Mm. Culture is nothing more than the practice of living people. And because we're still alive, mm -hmm. 
our culture is still being practiced. So culturally relevant, I think, got to be relevant to the people happening now, whatever that is. You know, um, culturally relevant. Uh, what is culturally relevant about chicken long rice? <laughs> it's ono. <laughs> Outside of ono and chicken. <laughs> <sighs> but I mean, so you know, fun. again, so culturally relevant, I, I, I don't know. I, I think as a Hawaiian and a Hawaii, uh what I have to offer when I teach is the combination of this culture. This culture is based on a 2,000 year culture, yes. But this culture is not over there, because I don't know that. I mean, and realistically, none of us do. Mm -hmm. We are constantly inventing and reinventing history. It's about time that we're doing it for ourselves mm -hmm. and other people not doing it for us, but we are reinventing history. But again, that's culturally relevant, yeah? Because all cultures reinvent their history and all cultures have a right to do that. Now, we Hawaiians, because this, this might be, because I think we, we, we've been suffering from a benign cultural racism. Uh, I mean, you know, it would be easy if it was black racism. Because easy, you know, yeah, black, white. Uh, Hawaiian, kind of, kind of hard, because, you know, if you look at even our music, okay, one of the most radical, politically radical kanaka writing music now, Skippy Iowani, mm -hmm. you listen to him, if you read his words, it's a baseball bat between the eye. If you listen to the song, it's this wonderful, sweet melody that's hitting you in the head between the eye. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, culturally relevant. That's mm, something that's mm. very particular to us Hawaiians. Mm. We take, I mean, you look at all Kalona Napua. Mm, be beautiful song. Beautiful. And what does it talk about? Hey, no sign of stupid paper. Smell with you. I read it, a rock. Uh, so we've made things, you know, uh, our own. And that's culturally relevant. So what art going to look like tomorrow? I don't know, but I think art by Hawaiians tomorrow will look a lot more Hawaiian than it did 30 years ago. And I think that's the important thing about culturally relevant uh, education, is that everybody's culture, I mean, you know, the one thing I really love about Hawaii, and the one thing that's really screwing me over now, is uh, I really love all the influences that made us. I mean, you know, I do love chicken long rice. Uh, I mean, you know, this beautiful amalgamation of everything. Mm. It's not a cliche. It is wonderful. Uh, I don't want to lose it. But I also do not want to turn into like, uh, Midwestern Chinese food. Mm -hmm. Where about the only thing Chinese about the food is the name on the restaurant. <laughs> you know, where everything becomes so bland, where, the cult where you don't hear the culture, where you don't smell that ono. You know, one thing I really love about Filipino food is that bugger will make you hungry before you even know where that smell coming from. <laughs> uh, and for me, I think that's what culturally relevant education is, you know. Uh, we learn from our Hawaii side, we learn from our Kepani side, we learn from our Hawaiian side. Uh, I'm glad that we finally have Hawaiian educators in the system. Re, 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 ra, finally caught the gang. Uh, you know, where we're finally educating Hawaiians as Hawaiians. Uh, that's my kai. You know, and I think all of this stuff is going to be, is really important. And it's really important, I think, for us to understand also that 30 years ago is about a generation, yeah? The state of our education for our people was well. Come in school, never even teach Hawaiian. They, they taught as much Hawaiian as public school. Public school was sixth grade, and that's it, Jack. Ah, uh, look at it now. Yeah. We've come a long way. Thank goodness. Uh, 30 years ago, there was no such thing as Hawaiian studies, probably. Now there's an entity. Mm -hmm. It's not even a department, it's an entity at the university system, done without the support of the general systems. 
we come a long way. I think done in spite of. Yeah. All of that is in spite of what was going on. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's those, when we look at the Hawaiian Renaissance period of what was happening um, in the 60s and the 70s, that flourishing of Native Hawaiians being educated and reclaiming our cultural practices um, and building a next, another generation. That's when Hawaiian language was mm -hmm. at its forefront navigation, halau, you know, Mary Monarch started in 71. Hawaiian rights. You know, Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian yeah, rights. Whoa. It's like really politically, Hawaiians became politically active yep. and vocal. So it's just those us flower children that graduated from high school in the 60s um, that helped to do that. I have one more question about this that I wanted to ask because we talked about culturally relevant art. What is art? Because Hawaiians don't have a word for art. Right, Akela? She's not paying attention to me. Oh, <laughs> she, she nodded. Just calling her out. No. What is, is, yeah. is, yeah. There, yeah. Yeah. is there a Hawaiian word for art? Do we have a Hawaiian no. word for art? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. the work of the wise, the, the wise work, wise. But, but I think that's, re we, if you look at the, if you look at the, art, the actual term in English, art, that's basically what it is. That's why there's art of anything. It's taking that thing to the best, to the highest, to the most, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, so art, for me, it just means, you know, you find something, you find your own, you make them better. Yeah. I think hana no eao, skilled art, yeah, skilled work. Skilled work. The work yeah. of skilled people, you know, so when people are, uh, for us, it's, I guess, you know, and you're, you're skilled at something, you know, the kahuna were skilled yeah, at, at huna. Yeah, huna, yeah. Yeah, the laau la pa'au were skilled at laau. Um, and, and so we look at people that were skilled craftsmen um, they were the kahuna va'a, they were the carvers that were Kalaiki, build Kalaiki, okay. you know. Yeah, so these were... The artists. The artists. These were the artists of our, of our cultural practice. Um, and so in, in most indigenous communities, there's really no word for, quote, art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have skilled people mm -hmm. in different areas, but there's no art as a translated... That, that translates into a Western um, term like art. We're just skilled people in different skills. Um, I think that that's something that is relevant in education because that's not, that is foreign to us as indigenous people, the term art and art schools. We just did it. Mm -hmm. And yet being skilled is not foreign to us at all. You know, being skilled in certain areas uh, having a gift in certain areas is not uh, foreign to us. It's uh, finding the ono. But it's also generational because you learn yeah. it within your ohana. Yeah. So this is, and, and which is something else that when you look at um, applying for funding and they ask you for a nepotism policy as an artist. Okay, I'm a kumuhula. <laughs> My son going to be the kumuhula. Oh, hello, is that nepotism? Yes. Okay, but you know, if you're a doctor, it's chances culture. are somebody else in your ohana gonna be the doctor. Mm -hmm. Do we have a nepotism mm -hmm. policy as an indigenous crafter? I mean, if you're a weaver, your grandma was a weaver, your mother was a weaver, mm -hmm. your daughter gonna be the weaver, your son gonna be the weaver, that's nepotism. It doesn't no, apply. Yes, uh, it doesn't tradition. apply to it's tradition. It's tradition. It's tradition. That's how we it said doesn't apply in an generation. indigenous cultural practice. And I can, I can see this in my hamana. Uh, I have uh, Mo'opuna, who is a uh, Kamehameha preschool at Ele Ele, uh, at Kamakani School on the west side of Kauai. And uh, he's been in that school for two years. And every year, his, his mother asked me to come and do a workshop for the hamana. Well, two years ago was the first time I ever took kapa to preschool. I never did a kapa workshop for preschool. First station, take the opihi and scrape the ili off the vauke. Second station, kuku. Third station, use the ohi kapala to stamp. And there were 20, 20, 12, anyway, they rotated. And you know, I could see already at that early age where their hand was the best. I could see it already. And my hamana, my mo'opuna, he, he scraped a little bit, then he'd go run. 
to mm -hmm. the drawing. He pound a little bit, then he go run over here. Uh, already, you can see one little girl, Kauanui Ohana. You can see in her hand, the, she, she didn't want to move to any of the other stations. She wanted to stay right there in Kuku. So there is intergenerational, there is in our, in our Koko and our Ivi, there is Ono in every child. So when I think of culturally skilled people, if we're not saying culturally arts, I also think that to me, I want our, our Hamana, our Keiki, to know the place where they live. I want them to know every rain, every wind, every kahavai. I want them to know their one hanao. I want them to know these places because it's my hope that when they grow up, they will malama our moku, our islands, all of and our kai. Can I cut I think, um, just to add, as an artist, as an educator, I think part of that finding that ono thing, the hana no eau, um, and generational thing too, is about the excellence, mm -hmm. about achieving the excellence. Mm -hmm. It'd be a personal mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I f I'm ono for this because I want to try to get to the point where what I'm producing is excellent, yep. so that you know I see my father doing this, and his work is excellent. Yeah. I'm going to strive to do what I can to that point. Mm -hmm. And then just a simple example, my daughter, she's, our daughter's two and a half, and I'm, you know, I usually make the bed, fold the bed, fold all the sheets and stuff, and do the laundry, and she's been watching me folding, and she wants to fold. Uh -huh. and she's folding tea towels, mm -hmm. and I'm teaching her corner to corner, mm -hmm. grab the loop, yeah. mm -hmm. So she's like paying attention to that and trying to be excellent at it. And I think that's, you know, the whole continuum, the whole yeah. cycle there, you know. It's as simple as just folding clothes. She's trying to strive to be excellent. Yeah. And, you know, thinking back culturally, we had to do that in order for our, our survival. I practice. Um, it's just inherent. And now, you know, I'm seeing Estria um, and being able to work with him with the urban, urban art, street art, whatever you want to call it, you know, moving into other realms, moving into you know, things that are relevant today in our context, and how do we, as a people, as a community, achieve the excellence? And like with the mural, mural work, mm -hmm. how do we get to a point where it's excellent and it's relevant you know, for the people working it, the people who are going to see it, and where it gets taken to. Um, a lot of it just comes, for me, comes back to the excellence. So, and, and that brings us to, I mean, the thing, the work that Estria is doing with, um, with um, street art, or mm -hmm. what we could call, I, I guess I would call it street art or mural art, um, you know, on on, um, we, so I did a tour of the Philadelphia Mural Arts Project. And um, where we go, and this is something I've been thinking for Mamo, one of the things that I think where we can... Where you can go where, next. Where we can go next on this. And I'm, I've been thinking about it, how do we, we do this? Because we have a lot of visual art sculptures um, that are, are public art. Mm -hmm. And so what the Mural Arts Program does is they get trolley, they sell trolley tours, and they take a guide mm. and take them to all of the, the artwork that's in the public and um, within the city and county of Philadelphia Arts Project. But it also has, has stimulated more art in the schools mm -hmm. so that, that the schools are giving up walls for that kind of art, mural arts program. Um, they're using it on parachute material because they realize that, you know, the, um, some of the artwork that's beautiful up there is also fading. Mm. What kind of materials now are we, can we use for that? But there's, there's a whole youth program mm -hmm. built around that kind of art and how we expand our... And it's a program that doesn't, it's not just one person with a spray can. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. It's still the support behind it. Yeah. Mm. And it's just like making kapa, yeah. making, you know, it's having that support knowing Planning. who to go to the experts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bill Money. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Make your first better. call. But integrated, you know, also integrated into, I mean, and, and there's, there's food for, for teaching other things other than just the painting of it. Mm -hmm. It's the planning of it. It's the theme of it. It's the historical research behind it. Mm -hmm. It's the mo'olelo of that art piece that, that gets tied into what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Or the holua sled. What is the history of that holua sled? Give me the legends. What are the legends that talk about historical figures that, are, that went holua sledding? Where are the traditional slides? Yeah. Where are where they, and where, how do we reclaim those areas? You know, that, that gets into the political Maybe side again. Company. Resource management, Department of Land and Natural Resources, trying to have access to those areas. Um, but we can only do that if we do the historical research. We can talk about the mo'olelo. We can identify those places. Yep. We have to look at where, mm -hmm. what are the traditional names for those areas, mm -hmm. and where mm -hmm. are they? Because mm -hmm. those traditional names are gone. Those locations are gone. Yeah. Where did they end up? They ended up here, and where do they slide in the ocean? Would they end up in the stream? How did they, how did they get down? And then, then the mathematical, how much pounds of weight is that? How fast are you going? You know, it's like, oh, we're going head first. Oh my gosh, okay. You know, what kind of protective gear? Nothing. Um, you know, how do you, crazy people did that? <laughs> it was like. Crazy well, people go know. down you the whole sled. Okay, no. You know Corey Tom? The, I you know, You see what he does yes. on mountains I with his skateboard? Yes, Same yes. thing. Same thing. <laughs> More dangerous because they know. get speed. <laughs> so, but I think, you know, I think you about all rocks. of those Yo. things. <laughs> How much weight can this support? Okay. Mm. And it's a little narrow thing. So I'm always fascinated by that. Um, what angle do, does it have to come down? Because uh, Pohaku wanted to do it on our Mamo stage at Hawaii Theater. I was like, I don't think so, because, <laughs> you know, the ramp has to be a little bit higher in the ceiling and longer, and this, you know, I, I'm not sure that will Wow. Go down, a, <laughs> go down the walkway so onto the stage. Right to I the middle, like, top the front door. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it Everybody was, hold this black <laughs> wood up. Right, right. What was the angle? I, I mean, he, he literally, that was the question. Can I do it on our wearable art show, come sliding down your ramp onto the... I was like, you know, you're going to come down there, you're going to get stuck. Because <laughs> there's no ramp long enough mm -hmm. to give you a little slide and kind of smooth it out. I, I, I'm not sure how that happens. But there's some mathematical things that have mm -hmm. to happen. Um, okay, let me see. I think we're, 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 we're doing good. Subject and make learning relevant. Build, build relationships. How does art build relationships? I'm always um, professing, you know, it's like networking. Mm -hmm. You know, being whatever form of art interests you. You gotta, I just tell my kids, you gotta network. You gotta, it's part of that being on, you know, having funny with Ono. It's great if you know it's Ono, but you gotta be proactive. You know, unless you, you're gonna be the one that goes out and finds everything and does everything yourself. Um, you're still gonna need to be proactive. At some stage, you're gonna come across something you need to Go research, uh, make a call, talk to somebody. And my kids that want to do fine arts, you got to go and build your portfolio. You got to go and talk to that uh, university. You got to go talk to that gallery. You got to you got to be proactive, and part of that is networking, um, building relationships, and not just with people, but with your materials, mm -hmm. um, your resources. Mm -hmm. uh, it you know, and is it important for you to find Hamana that you can pass that information oh, yeah. on to? Yeah. So, I've always know. had <laughs> this idea that artists, especially because, you know, they work on their own piece and it's a personal relationship with that piece and, and or that whatever they're creating, that that's the relationship that they're building in that sense. And then, you know, when we're starting MAMO, it's a collective gathering of artists together awesome. to, um, to work in the same tent, to talk about their art, to talk about what they're doing, the, the gathering space at, Mer at Mary Monarch in the arts markets. Those are opportunities where artists gather to collaborate on things. Mm -hmm. And the recent uh, collaborations that we've been having here that you've been involved with, uh, um, uh, Carl with, uh, and Imai, was the Sheraton Waikiki, murals with a mural that was here at, um, at the 
uh, convention center and other places where uh, with Meliana Meyer trying to pull artists together to work on things collectively. So building those relationships um, among artists at, our, at a really high end level, how do we just bridge that to the next generation other than those of you that are teaching in, in high school or in other, other areas? How do we inspire the next generation of artists and where, where does that intersect? Where does that happen? Well, let me tell you, let me tell you one, a classic one actually involving our two uh, I'm working now with Corey, Corey Tom, Young Hawaiian, uh, Dynamite Hawaiian, good artist. And I got Corey from Carl. And I met Carl <laughs> from when we started first doing art. Uh, so relationships, mm -hmm. you know, relationships. And now we have what, a two generation relationship mm -hmm. yeah. uh, working with just, you know, uh, I, I think. I think good people, in, good people attract good people, and that's where the relationship starts. Because then, you know, you gave him to me because you knew me, you know, and it's that kind of relation. I'm turning him on to people that I know, and it's not just with art. Corey's getting quite a political education in my house. <laughs> but you know, I think that's that kind of relationship is the stuff I like. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's important that, um, I think we're at a point now where there is more personal relationships being built up in our art, in our art world, mm -hmm. uh, where we're actually starting to feed off personally each other, because we've been doing these group things for 30 years mm -hmm. now, okay? It's been almost impossible for any Hawaiian to do a solo show. I mean, it is really impossible. Uh, so we've been working together. Sometimes not quite so together, but we've been working <laughs> together for about 30 years. And it's not that personal like this. This is like mm. one personal trip. Mm. This is like, you know, I got this young boy from this young boy who taught. And this is all within a Hawaiian realm. And that is a Kamehameha thing. I'm not a Kamehameha guy. So now we've broken that part to another, that relationship went outside mm -hmm. of Kamehameha to Kapalama. Bottom couple, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's you know again it's that generational thing that we're passing along, you know uh, in the old days I guess carvers would learn because their sons learn from their fathers. Well, that kind of relationship kind of doesn't happen anymore mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. but it does happen this way, and I'm glad it's finally happening. You know, mm -hmm. like it's, come here, I finally woke up. Uh, yay! A mentor to mentor. <laughs> I know. I know in the in the. We have a statewide hui of kapa makers, and uh, this began with Marie McDonald up there mm -hmm. in Waimea on Moku Keawe, and it extends uh, on to every island. So through this collaborative effort, a couple of years ago, we made pa'u for the pa'u, malo, and kihei for the kanaka ole halau to wear at the uh, hoike uh, before Mary Monarch that Wednesday night, and that was exciting. That was exciting to work on a, a presentation piece, a piece that they would use, I would actually use, you know, on stage. And then you have to decide what mo'olelo you're going to tell. There's so many to choose from, but you have to narrow it down. And then you have to decide what, what dyes you're going to use and what designs you're going to put on it. But for me, it comes down to what mo'olelo do I want to tell? And so this next collaborative effort is uh, coming up in December on Maui uh, through uh, Hoku, uh, Vicky's cousin. And uh, we have uh, two projects there that are coming up. One is, uh, again, to make pa'u, malo, and kihei for the kanaka ole halau uh, to present at Maui Arts and Culture Center. And the second part of that is to have uh, an art exhibit Miley Andrade is the director of the exhibit, and she's already said she wants contemporary, <laughs> contemporary. And I'm, my, I, my, you know, I, I'm just, the ideas are swirling, are swirling. Because uh, both of my uh, tutu wahine uh, were hanau on Maui, one at Waihe'e, one at Kaupo. And there are mo'olelo galore between Kaupo and Waihe'e and all that Novai Eha area. 
and all the Iao area. And through the chant that Vicky had taught us about Kepani uh, Vai Ao Iao. Eh? And so all oh, the visuals, the visuals are coming. Now I just have to implement it. But this, um, uh, it, it's an exciting time. And it's also important uh, to bring up the uh, next generation. And I am actively looking for those who have the interest and have the, uh, who have the commitment, yeah, to stay in there. And they're there. I just now have to make time to hold uh, a few more workshops on a regular basis and to encourage the broader community uh, to come as well. You know, our wonderful kumu at Kawaikini School are, are so, they have so much they have to do. And so I said, all right, bring in the ohana, bring in the aunties, bring in the tutu, bring in anybody else who wants to learn how to do this so that all together we can help those haumana uh, to ho'omau. Yeah, what uh, Imai was saying, you know, for myself, that when I was at Corey's, Corey's 22, 23. Young guy. Yeah, and in high school, I, mean, I didn't have the awareness that people like Imai were out there in the community. Mm. That, you know, the only art I was looking at was Western art, Renaissance, you know, Cubism. That was what art was supposed to be. And to be exposed to people like Imai, it, it would be a crime if I didn't share people like that with my, my Hamana. And, you know, through those relationships, knowing that the person that Corey is, or I was able to understand, you know, get to know, I thought that would be an amazing pairing. You know, there's like um, personas there. And, interest and things that are all no. Um, I, I just, you know, if it was gonna work, it was gonna work. And it's, it's, you know, the artwork is the product of that relationship. It's the, the fruit, it's that seed that they put out that hopefully others will see and get inspired. Uh, uh, just, so much is not known about our contemporary artists or artists that uh, needs, needs, to be, um, needs to be shared more, yeah. I think we've, okay. we've, we're talking about both traditional and contemporary artwork because both, uh, or all of our artists, the world, and Kauka works primarily in traditional weaving and kapa making, and then Carl and um, Imai also work in the both, both contemporary, mostly contemporary for Imai and contemporary for um, Carl as well. So we're looking at both contemporary and traditional artists and, what, and, and where as an educator, we can extend the art into other subject matters, into other realms, but identifying, I think what's, what's relevant about this particular panel is looking for, and I'm gonna borrow Imai's term, looking for the ono like in that. every hamana finding that interest and, and, and nurturing that and feeding that interest. Feed that, yeah, mm -hmm. until you're so full. That, um, so I think that's part of when we say we hanai haumana, we hanai or you feed them. You need to feed them the material until they're full to f so that they can find their ono, find their mm -hmm their mm -hmm. niche in, in mm -hmm. their field and then holomua and like what Carl has done is pass that hamana on so that I've given you as much as I, I can mm -hmm. at this moment in time, let me be an inspiration, but here's another, another kumu that can be an inspiration to you. So understanding when that happens and how you can nurture the hamana, um, how you can nurture students and how you can provide other avenues for them to um, enrich themselves in, in culturally relevant art education-based system. So um, I'm gonna thank my panelists. My yeah. My <laughs> Yeah, my I wanna thank them for a lot of inspiration for, um, for our educators and for, for, 
for um, sharing of your mana'o and your really being open to sharing um, your thoughts and your feelings with, um, with all of us. Thank you so much. Mahalo. Oh, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.